You've seen a witness tonight of the strength of two counselors in this First Presidency. I stand before you and declare your First Presidency is united as one under the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. We remind you that the Tabernacle Choir broadcast will be from 9.30 to 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. The Sunday morning session will immediately follow. We express appreciation to the Priesthood Choir from the Provo Missionary Training Center for the beautiful music they provided this evening and to the speakers for their inspiring messages. I want to especially thank this Missionary Choir. I had an experience I think that they may be interested in, and you may find it interesting also. I had a desperate call from the head of the Missionary Training Center. He said, President Monson, I have a missionary who is going home. And he said, nothing can prevent him from quitting. I said, well, that's not singular. It's happened before. What's his problem? He said he's been called to a Spanish-speaking mission, and he's absolutely certain he cannot learn Spanish. I said, I have a suggestion for you. Tomorrow morning, have him attend the class learning Japanese. <laughs> and then have him report to you at 12 noon. The next morning, I wondered when he'd call. He called at 10 o'clock. <laughs> he said, the young man is here with me now and he wants me to know he's absolutely certain he can learn Spanish. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> I think I mentioned, but if I didn't, I'll repeat it. Following my remarks, this session will conclude with the choir seeking our call ye nations, and the benediction will then be offered by Elder Keith R. Edwards of the 70. Now, as I speak to you tonight, truly, you're a royal priesthood, assembled many places, but in unity. In all likelihood, this could well be the largest assemblage of priesthood holders ever to come together. Your devotion to your sacred callings is inspiring. Your desire to learn your duty is evident. The purity of your souls brings heaven closer to you and your families. Many areas of the world have experienced difficult economic times. Businesses have failed, jobs have been lost, and investments have been jeopardized. We must make certain that those for whom we share responsibility do not go hungry or unclothed or unsheltered. When the priesthood of this Church work together as one in meeting these vexing conditions, near miracles take place. We urge all Latter-day Saints to be prudent in their planning, to be conservative in their living, and to avoid excessive or unnecessary debt. The financial affairs of the Church are being managed in this manner. For we are aware that your tithing and other contributions have not come without sacrifice and our sacred funds. Let us make our homes, brethren, sanctuaries of righteousness, places of prayer, and abodes of love, that we might merit the blessings that can come only from our Heavenly Father. We need His guidance in our daily lives. In this vast throng is priesthood power and the capacity to reach out and share the glorious gospel with others. As has been mentioned, we have the hands to lift others from complacency and inactivity. We have the hearts to serve faithfully in our priesthood callings. 
and thereby inspire others to walk on higher ground, to avoid the swamps of sin, which threaten to engulf so many. The worth of souls is indeed great in the sight of God. Ours is the precious privilege, armed with this knowledge, to make a difference in the lives of others. The words found in Ezekiel could well pertain to all of us who follow the Savior in this sacred work. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. How might we merit this promise? What will qualify us to receive this blessing? Is there a guide to follow? May I suggest three imperatives for our consideration. They apply to the deacon as well as to the high priest. They are within our reach. A kind Heavenly Father will help us in our quest. First, learn what we should learn. Second, do what we should do. And third, be what we should be. Let us discuss these objectives that we might be profitable servants in the sight of the Lord. First, learn what we should learn. The Apostle Paul placed an urgency on our efforts to learn. He said to the Philippians, One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press forward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And to the Hebrews he urged, Lay aside sin. Let us run with patience the race set before us, looking for an example unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. President Stephen L. Richards, who served for many years in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and then in the First Presidency, spoke often to holders of the priesthood and emphasized his philosophy pertaining to it. He declared, the priesthood is usually simply defined as the power of God delegated to man. This definition, I think, is accurate. He continued, but for practical purposes, I like to define the priesthood in terms of service, and I frequently call it the perfect plan of service. Close quote. I do so because it seems to me that it is only through the utilization of the divine power conferred on men that they may ever hope to realize the full importance and vitality of this endowment. It is an instrument of service, and the man who fails to use it is apt to lose it, for we are plainly told by revelation that he who neglects it shall not be counted worthy to stand." Close quote. President Harold B. Lee, 11th President of the Church and one of the great teachers in the Church, put his counsel in easy-to-understand terms. Said he, You see, when one becomes a holder of the priesthood, he becomes an agent of the Lord. He should think of his calling as though he were on the Lord's errand." Close quote. Now, some of you may be shy by nature or consider yourselves inadequate to respond affirmatively to a calling. Remember, this is not yours and mine alone. It's the Lord's work. And when we're on the Lord's errand, we're entitled to the Lord's help. Remember that the Lord will shape the back to bear the burden placed upon it. While the formal classroom may be intimidating at times, 
some of the most effective teaching takes place other than in the chapel or the classroom. Well, do I remember that about this season some years ago, members holding the Aaronic priesthood would eagerly look forward to an annual outing commemorating the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. By the busload, the young men of our state journeyed 90 miles north to the Clarkston Cemetery, where we viewed the grave of Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. While surrounding the beautiful granite shaft which marks his grave, a high counselor, Bishop Glenn L. Rudd, would present background concerning the life of Martin Harris, read from the Book of Mormon his testimony, and there then bear his own witness to the truth. The young men listened with rapt attention, touched the gentle and granite marker, and pondered the words they had heard and the feelings they had felt. At a park in Logan, lunch was enjoyed. The group of young men were then lie down on the lawn at the Logan Temple and gaze upward at its lofty spires. Often beautiful white clouds would hurry past the spires, moved along by a gentle breeze. The purpose of temples was taught. Covenants and promises became much more than words. The desire to be worthy to enter those temple doors entered those youthful hearts. Heaven was very close. Learning what we should learn was assured. Number two, do what we should do. In a revelation on priesthood given through Joseph Smith the prophet, recorded as the 107th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, learning moves to doing as we read Wherefore now let every man learn his duty and to act in the office in which he is appointed in all diligence. Each priesthood holder attending this session tonight has a calling to serve, to put forth his best efforts in the work assigned to him. No assignment is menial in the work of the Lord, for each has eternal consequences. President John Taylor warned us, if you do not magnify your calling, God will hold you responsible for those whom you might have saved had you done your duty. And who of us can afford to be responsible for the delay of eternal life of a human soul? If great joy is the reward of saving one soul, then how terrible must be the remorse of those whose timid efforts have allowed a child of God to go unwarned or unaided so that he has to wait till a dependable servant of God comes along." Close quote. The old adage is ever true. Do your duty, that is best, leave unto the Lord the rest. Most service given by priesthood holders is accomplished quietly, without fanfare. A friendly smile, a warm hand clasp, a sincere testimony of truth can literally lift lives, not pianos, change human nature, and save precious souls. An example of such service was the missionary experience of Julius and Dorothy Fusek, who were called to fill a two-year mission in Poland. Brother Fusek was born in Poland. He spoke the language. He loved the people. Sister Fusek was English and knew little of anything of Poland and its people. But trusting in the Lord, they embarked on their assignment. The living conditions were primitive. They were lonely. Their task, immense. A mission had not at that time been established in Poland. The assignment given the Fusiks was to prepare the way, 
that a mission could be established so that other missionaries could be called to serve, people could be taught, converts could be baptized, branches could be established, and chapels erected. Did Elder and Sister Fusik despair because of the enormity of their assignment? Not for a moment. They knew their calling was from God. They prayed for His divine help, and they devoted themselves wholeheartedly to their work. They remained in Poland not two years, but five years. All of the foregoing objectives were realized. Elders Russell M. Nelson, Hans B. Rinker, and I, accompanied by Elder Fusik, met with Minister Adam Wolpatka of the Polish government. We heard him say, I quote, Your church is welcome here. You may build your buildings. You may send your missionaries. You are welcome in Poland. Words from heaven. This man, pointing to Julius Fusik, has served your church well. You can be grateful for his example and his work. Close quote. Like the Fusiks, let us do what we should do in the work of the Lord. Then we can, with Julius and Dorothy Fusick, echo the psalm, My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Third, be what we should be. Paul counseled his beloved friend and associate Timothy, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. I would urge all of us to pray concerning our assignments and to seek divine help that we might be successful in accomplishing that which we are called to do. Someone has said that the recognition of a power higher than man himself does not in any sense debase him. He must seek, believe in, pray, and hope that he will find no such sincere prayer effort by prayer will go unanswered. That is the way, constitution of the philosophy of faith. Divine favor will attend those who humbly Seek it. From the Book of Mormon comes counsel that says it all. The Lord speaks, Therefore what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, Even as I am. And what manner of man was he? What example did he set in his service? From John chapter 10 we learn, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not his, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he's a hireling, and careth not for the sheep said the Lord, I am the Good Shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Brethren, may we learn what we should learn, do what we should do, and be what we should be. By so doing, the blessings of heaven will attend. We will know that we're not alone. He who notes the sparrows fall will in his own way acknowledge us. Several years ago, I received a letter from a longtime friend. He bore his testimony in that letter. I'd like to share part of it with you tonight since it illustrates the strength of the priesthood and one who learned what he should learn, who did what he should do, 
and who always tried to be what he should be. I shall read excerpts of that letter from my friend, Theron W. Borup, who passed away three years ago at the age of 90. At the age of eight, when I was baptized, he said, and received the Holy Ghost, I was much impressed about being good and able to have the Holy Ghost to be a help throughout my life. I was told that the Holy Ghost associated only in good company and that when evil entered our lives, he would not leave. Not knowing when I would need his promptings and guidance, I tried to so live that I would not lose this gift. On one occasion, he said, it saved my life. During World War II, I was an engineer, said he, engineer gunner in a B-24 bomber fighting in the South Pacific. One day, an announcement was made that the longest bombing flight ever made would be attempted to knock out an oil refinery. The promptings of the Spirit told me I would be assigned on this flight and that I would not return. At the time, I was the president of the LDS group. The combat was ferocious as we flew over Borneo. Our plane was hit by attacking planes and soon burst into flames, and the pilot told us, prepare to jump. I went out last. We were shot at by enemy pilots as we floated down. I had trouble inflating my life raft. Bobbing up and down in the water, I began to drown and passed out. I came to momentarily and cried, God save me. Again, I tried inflating the life raft and was successful with just enough air in it to keep me afloat. I rolled over on top of it, too exhausted to move. For three days we floated about in enemy territory, with ships all about us and planes overhead. Why they couldn't see a yellow group of rafts on blue water is a mystery to me, he wrote. A storm came up and waves 30 feet high almost tore our rafts apart. Three days went by with no food or water. The others asked me if I prayed. I answered that I surely did pray and that we would indeed be rescued. That evening we saw our submarine, which we thought had come to rescue us, but it passed us by. The next morning it did the same. We knew this was the last day it would be in the area. Then came the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Theron, you have the priesthood. Command the sub to pick you up. Brother Borup si said silently, I prayed, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the priesthood, turn around and pick us up. <laughs> in a few minutes, they were alongside of us. When on deck, the captain said, I don't know how we ever found you. We're not even looking for you. But I knew, he said, I leave with you my testimony that this work in which we are engaged is true. The Lord is at the helm, that we may ever follow Him is my sincere prayer. And I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.